highway telling me to go where I can Hello and welcome to the Light in the Attic podcast. My name is Matt Sullivan from Light in the Attic. Thanks for joining us today. We recently traveled back to Memphis, Tennessee, where we've done a number of projects over the years. And Jeff Powell over at the Sam Phillips Recording Service gave us a nice uh, tour of the facilities, which um, were absolutely amazing. As uh, you'd imagine, for those that don't know, uh, Sam Phillips was the uh, genius behind the Sun Records, where he recorded everybody from Jerry Lee Lewis to Elvis, um, you know, Johnny Cash, the list goes on and on. Uh, soon after, in 1960, he opened up the Sam Phillips Recording Service in Memphis, where he uh, he and others recorded everybody from, you know, more Johnny Cash and Hank Williams Jr. to, you know, Phil Collins, Dylan, Alex Chilton, Bob Skaggs, uh, John Prine, the list goes on and on. Well, Jeff Powell over at Sam Phillips gave us a tour of the facilities, um, including Sam's office, which was pretty amazing. And uh, all the old studio, the studio room, and it was just uh, just breathtaking. So it was an honor to go there, and we thought we'd record uh, the tour. Um, we couldn't resist. Jeff's worked on a lot of amazing records over the years, and he's a very sweet, humble guy and incredibly talented. And, and these days cuts loads of lacquers. But he's worked on, you know, many notable records for people like Listen to Williams and, you know, Primal Scream and the recent Tom Dowd sessions that just came out from the early 90s the afghan wigs gentleman personal favorite of mine and uh zillions of other records that uh we we, we can't have time to, we don't have enough time to mention today but again big thanks to jeff and everyone there if you're in memphis um he's a great person to uh, grab a beer with if you can if you have the opportunity so uh this is uh our last episode for 2018 of the lightning Act podcast we look forward to 2019 have a good holiday and wherever you may be over the coming weeks and uh talk to you in the new year take care bye bye all right hi i'm jeff powell um i've been a in the record industry for over 30 years now here in memphis tennessee i worked at arden for i was an employee there for 10 years and freelanced out of there Learned to cut vinyl uh, in 2008, and then I left there in 2015 and came over here to San Phillips Recording Service, and I've been here ever since, and I have a Norman BMS 70 lathe that I run in the old control room of Studio B. Cool. Thanks for having us. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, so Tell let me just kind place. of show you around. So um, Sam came over here, I believe it was a muffler shop before he completely got it and redesigned it as a studio and this was his dream studio so as you, we walk around here you're kind of like kind of like being in the mind of Sam Phillips it's pretty crazy um, and what year was that it started uh, 1959 he did the build out and I think they did their first session in 1960 they may have recorded a little bit at the end of 59 but right around in there um, and every kind of inch of the studio is, is designed with audio in mind you were standing here in the hallway right now the entryway, but we put guitar amps out here all the time. You know, it sounds it sounds great. There's no parallel surfaces. Everything is intentional. You, and and we have, as you'll see here in a minute, we have three uh, uniquely designed echo chambers, all that all work. And um, of all the studios I've worked in in the world, I've never heard anything like it. They're just absolutely beautiful. So. Um, that's just one of the one of the treats here. You'll you'll hear the studio when we walk in. It's a fairly dead space. It's got, um, but it wasn't that way in the beginning. I believe it was a linoleum floor at first, but then they put carpet in in the seventies and put some ISO booths in. But we'll get to that here in a second. You probably ought to start by looking in the bathroom. That's All right. Yeah, take a look. I always joke and say, "Don't look in the mirror." Wow. Because it's all no. mirrors. <laughs> oh man, amazing. That's all originally. See the makeup table back yeah, in the corner. Yeah. Amazing. Sam Phillips. I gotta check out the makeup, uh, makeup yeah. area. Mm. Wow. Beautiful. And then you go this way, and uh, this is the shop. When I got here in 15, it literally was pretty much piled to the ceiling with stuff. Um, and take, come on in. Wesley, don't run and hide. 
This guy's from Lightning. Yeah, this is Wesley Graham. Hey there, hi. Uh, Matt, nice to meet Wesley you. Wesley, how are you doing? Engineers and assistant you, engineers and fixes Daniel? gear yeah. and um, good to meet you. kind of the everything. Nice you. Yeah, so this is his little cubby hole back here. Cool. But again, all this was really literally kind of had to dig out, dig out of this place because it was just and we we'd find stuff and like holy crap, man, here's a UA compressor. This thing's get it working again. And so we've got you'll see in the rack we got most of the stuff working again. Here is the lounge. It's a tiny little lounge. The couch lounge. and the table. The relax lounge. Looks comfy. The relax this was lounge. Yeah, that's what they call it. Truly the relax lounge. The relax lounge. And this is pretty this is all original. Uh, I mean it might have been refurbished, but it was something. Yeah, yeah, it's been refurbished. Um, I'm not sure what year they did that. It was like this when I came over in fifteen. You can see the picture of Sam and that's his sons, Knox and Jerry. Um, and Jerry is still very active, and it's his daughter, Hallie, so Sam's granddaughter, Hallie, who really um, was instrumental in reviving the studio again and really getting it all cleaned up and going. She kind of recruited me and Matt Rossbang to come over here. And, um, she would be here every day if she could. She, she helps run three radio stations for the family in, in Alabama. Mm, oh, that's still cool. on. Keeps her busy. Is yeah. it okay to take photos or? Yeah. Okay, good. The only places not allowed for photos are in Sam's office and in the echo chamber. Okay, got it. This is kind of a great shot right here. Yeah, it is. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's step on across the hall here. Let's go in the studio first. This is Studio A. So you can hear, right when you walk in, you hear how dead it is. So. With Studio A, you said. Yeah, Studio A, and uh, wow. it really uh, lends itself well for doing live, you know, everybody out in the room, live recording. It's a real simple headphone system, which, you know, almost every studio now has the eight-channel mixers for every musician. They can mix their own thing, and inevitably, inevitably, whenever you go out and try to hear what they're hearing, everyone just has themselves turned up louder than everything else. It's really kind of nice to have this stereo mix that everybody has to start the session by kind of agreeing and, you know, getting where everybody can hear. And they have to kind of turn down a little bit too, um, which allows them to hear each other in the room better. And it really does affect the performances mm -hmm. I've found. So it's pretty amazing. Um, How often is the studio being used these days? All the time. Yeah. It's, it's booked. It's, it's booked all the time. It's, uh, we just did a really fun thing. Uh, Matt did a produced by series for Amazon, so produced by Matt Rossbang, and he we just did an Al Green session in here. First time Al's recorded, I think, in ten years. Bruce from Fat Possum yeah. last night mentioned this session. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounded like it went well. Yeah, it was Al, it was incredible. Al, but you know, I was happy with it too. Yeah, he's he really liked it. He came in, he worked hard. You know, I mean, it went fast. It's one of those when we cut the song um, that Freddie Fender song. I'll be there before the next teardrop falls. And it really does sound like the the old days, man. It's got horns and strings and girls and um, and Al singing, man. He can still sing his ass off. It's just unbelievable. I gotta hear that. And he left, and we all kind of sat there and went, "What just happened? <laughs> that was Al Green in here, man." Um, so yeah, like I was saying, in, originally this was a linoleum floor, and you have these doors here on the wall. You can open and close for either being more absorptive or more reflective. Uh, Sam designed those in the beginning. You can notice the ceiling, too. If you've been to Sun, it's like that. Only at Sun, it goes the length of the room. But that's Sam's design as well. Just to, There's no parallel surfaces, so there's no ringy, no ringy thing going on in here, or standing waves like that. The booths came in, I think, in the late 70s or the 80s, but they're fantastic, too. Most of the time, we use that as a vocal booth, but this little funky one over here, if you want that old, dead... 1970s drum sound man you can kind of just throw them in there and put two mics kind of anywhere really and mm -hmm. it's just bam that's there hmm. um so we do all kind you know we do all kinds of stuff here it's it's been great and uh like i said i'm mostly cutting vinyl these days but you know for now for now green session i'll come out of my cubby hole <laughs> and, you know, I, I, can, I can work it out it's a beautiful room it just has a vibe to it it really just... does man it's it i always say about well, records that we're making here they sound like some place you know some of my favorite records growing up you when you listen to the old vinyl records you know it takes you somewhere and it sounds like some place in your head yep 
I feel like today with modern music so much, there's so much homogeny and everybody's using the, the same plugins and reverbs and, you know, and just making it as loud as it can get. And there's a real beauty to the way we record here. Uh, really keeping in mind the old, you know, sticking to the old ways a lot. We can do the other thing too, but um, that's mostly the kind of stuff that we're doing. What are your, what are your, some, some of your favorite all-time records that have been made in here over the last... There's some interesting... Wooly Bully was all cut in this room. Oh, shit, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, um, we, we worked with Ray Stinnett on reissuing a record, releasing for the first time a record he did for A&M, cut in... Out here, I can't think of the Memphis studio in 70, 71. That's great. I should send you. Okay, yeah, awesome. That's crazy. I didn't realize Wooly Bully was done yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Lee owed Sam a couple records still when they came over. Here's one of the first to record. So on this, he's recorded on this piano before. <laughs> uh, Charlie Rich. Um, those are some of the older. John Prine did Pink Cadillac here. Um, we had a fun thing. Matt recorded his new record, John Prine's new record, with Dave Cobb producing in That's Nashville. A, I have that record. It's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, so John was in town for a, an award show or something, and... He hadn't really spent any time here since he did Pink Cadillac in the 70s. And so I was lucky enough to be invited to, to go out to eat with him the night before after with Matt after the award show. And I asked his wife when John got up, I said, would it be too much if I, I'd love to give him a present, you know, if I were to cut one of the songs off Pink Cadillac in front of him and give it to him as a present, would mm. that be over the top? She goes, no, he'd love it. So he came in here and he's walking around. He started telling stories. He was talking about the song Vietnam. And uh, how they cut it, and he said, you know, they were in here playing it, and uh, Sam had come down here and said, do you know what halftime is, boy? And he said, yeah. He said, play it half of half. He goes, so he goes, he made us play it like that for like an hour. We were just like, like walking through mud, man. And then he brought it back up to to half speed, and he goes, it felt like we were just locked right in. He said, and then he took the guitar amp, stuck it in the echo chamber, and turned it all the way up and blew it up and uh, he said this should sound like this is vietnam man this should sound like shrapnel flying through the air now that's the guitar sound he goes and put some sex in it boys and he said they got they got the take you know after messing wow. with it for like a day so sam kind of came out of retirement to produce produce that song john kind of went man i'd like to I, I haven't heard that in forever and i said you're in luck come next door so i i had that up queued up ready to go so i cut it in front of him and Played it back, and his wife Fiona was uh, filming in the room, and John was sitting there listening, and Jerry standing behind him. And it actually, he's kind of sent, mouthing the words along to it, and he turns around to Jerry, and he's like, Wasted youth, man. <laughs> and he turned around, and he had a tear in his eye. Wow. It really got to him. It was great. It was That's a moment. Man. Great. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And then we went in the next room, Matt's room, and listened to the new record, and um, there were cool. tears there, too. Wow, it was just, cool. you know, that was, a, that was a big day yeah, for me. Yeah, I bet. He's I my bet. hero. Um, that new record, you probably that was probably made like a couple year and a half ago or something. Yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. Pretty recent, yeah. And John, uh, he bought Matt a Cadillac. Matt's got him a Cadillac that John Prine gave him. Now, um, John said, you know, I guess crazy. If you don't, he's only allowed to have six or something like that. <laughs> so he had to get rid of one to get another one that he wanted. And Matt was talking about he wanted to get an old Cadillac, and John was like, don't. Don't go get one just yet, and so got one yeah, for you. Yeah, I got one for you. So he gave him a Cadillac. That's nice. He goes, "This look good sitting out in front of Phillips." I'm like, "That's really cool, man." Did the building outside used to be a baby blue, and now it's no? These are more... original colors. Okay, okay, okay. They actually found old cans of paint and matched gotcha, it right. exactly. I love um, the color. I feel like at one point it was a. a, a it's it's kind of Howard Johnson's, maybe a little bit. Yeah, you know? I love it. A little Hojo yeah, vibe. But it is, it is it's a comfortable place, and you, it, it really does get on the music here, you know? Some of these microphones are microphones that Sam picked out himself. He held 48s and 47s, he picked them out of a whole mess of microphones, and he did a damn good job, because they sound amazing. <laughs> so here's the control room. This over here is a baby Neve um, that's just on loan from Rupert Neve. Let us borrow it for a minute. They're trying to make us fall in love with it. Um, we do a lot of stuff to tape still, so we got a Studer 24 track. Our Pro Tools, we didn't even have Pro Tools rig over here when I started. Everything was analog. Mm. Um, 
Matt brought over his Atari digital recording system, and uh, Matt used to work at Sun. He managed Sun for years, and so he brought that over here, and then we've switched to, we got the Burl converters, and those things are fantastic. They sound as close to tape as anything digital that I've heard, so mm. they have a transformer, transformer in every input channel. Those are pretty amazing. So a lot of this gear here, this was what I was talking about that was buried underneath stuff, and, and uh, a lot of this stuff over here, uh, that's all pieces that were laying around and that are now working and put, put them to put them it's to incredible use. Incredible work you guys have put in this place. What's that? Uh, incredible the work you put into this. It's spot, a love. Right? It's a it's a labor of love for sure, man. It's um, it's hard to even call it work here. You know, every time I put my key in the door here every day, it's just I feel really lucky. Yeah. You know, well, I've come to Memphis off and on to visit Daniel here and Andrea Lyle probably for the last decade or oh, so, I and I've always day. she's great, and I've always dreamed about coming in this building <laughs> so uh we can't thank yeah, you enough for this tour I'm, it's, it's I'm phenomenal. happy to show you around man pretty magical place and that office across me went from me here this is that's judd phillips office judd is the first cousin of knox and jerry okay so sam is his uncle wow. uncle sam okay okay uh but judd hand judd kind of handles the studio bookings and he does a lot of the publishing work and the licensing stuff mm -hmm. there's quite a catalog that he manages and um, so it's a real family operation here Judd's awesome so this is my room um, the line where the cedar shake starts here that was the floor the level of the floor so you'd walk in and you'd walk up the steps um, we pulled all that out not really knowing what was because this needs to be on a concrete slab on the don't put one of these on the second floor anywhere because mm -hmm. the vibrations will make it wobble and go to disc and everything. So um, I don't know if you noticed, but there is a trolley line that runs by yeah. here that's been shut down since I started here. So how far was the fire from here? The trolley I don't caught on know. fire like right almost out front. Really? Maybe close to when was the trolley? Trolley. Fire? There were several trolley in a minute there. They shut them all down for yeah. a while. Now they're starting to run, to run again. They haven't. Open come by part. here so you know i'm gonna have to do some testing i knew that when i moved in here but if the trolley makes everything vibrate i'm gonna have to float this on an air table literally oh man that'll be you know what's money another 20 grand you know? <laughs> uh, i have a friend who, who has had to do that he, it's like one of these that they put mr where they do mris and stuff and laser stuff they have to have no vibration at all mm -hmm. so it'll just make that much quieter records i guess but uh I don't have any problem now. I've always joked too. I said if you keep hearing about the tracks being blown up outside Sam Phillips, maybe it was me. <laughs> <laughs> they did it to themselves, it seems like so far. And what's, yeah. What, and what's the history of this one? So this is a Neumann VMS seventy lathe. Um, I bought it from Chad Cassum in Salina, Kansas. And like we were talking out there, they're so rare to be able to find one at all. I just, I really got lucky because it was kind of looking like. I'd either need, if I wanted to keep cutting vinyl, I was going to need to move and work for somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, and they would take half the money too, probably. Yeah. And it just, it wasn't looking good, you know, because the expense of moving and going somewhere else, and I, I didn't, you know, I wanted to stay here, and um, so everything just kind of, the stars kind of aligned and everything fell into place. Uh, I have Chris Muth maintains it, and he's the best in the world, um, so it's it's meant, he comes down and waves his magic hand over it, puts a drop of oil here or there, and makes sure yeah, yeah. everything's running tip-top shape. It's still, you know, it's like having an old car. It's still, uh, you'll have you'll have things go out on you here and there, but, you know, you just got to deal with it. And keep, they're old machines, but for the most part, they run, you know. It, it really makes great sounding records. So. How many records you say you've been cutting this last year? Or like, Well, in the, I, mean, I cut my first record three years ago this month, so... Um, on this I'm, machine. On this machine. Right. And uh, so I've, I've already cut over a thousand records since I've been here. So that's The record, cool. it, it hasn't had much downtime. No, no. <laughs> None. As a matter of fact, whenever, you know, if I've left town for a week or something, or if it sits in here, um, it gets mad at me. And every time, you know, like, I come back and it won't, you know, it'll do something to, to spit at me mm -hmm. till it, you know, it likes to keep working, you know, <laughs> so I'm superstitious about it. Uh, but I keep a real simple chain. Um, literally, when I first 
when when Chris first got here, you know, he he's such a wizard at it, and he's crawling around and fixing stuff and telling me to send him this tone and that tone, and up to the time it was time to take him to the airport, and I'd drop him off at the airport, and I hadn't even cut anything yet. I'm like, what what just happened? How, how, how much was that, you know? <laughs> um, I came back and put on a disc and cut a silent groove. That's what we always, That's what I do every record I cut, even, and you just make sure you don't hear any noises or anything like that. And I dropped the needle and listened, and I was like, well, crap, the speakers aren't on. Yeah, they're on. And it was so quiet that I couldn't tell it was on. Damn, wow. So I was like, whoa, and then played, cut some music and played it back, and I'm like, Chris sounds incredible. I'm in business, man. <laughs> I know. What was the first thing you cut? Do you remember? Uh, the first album I cut was Memphis Heat, that wrestling record. Oh, wow. Yeah, for Sher- Sherman. Sherman, yeah. yeah. It was, awesome. it was perfect. It was perfect. I know, right? And That's I had perfect. this scribe on it, I remember, in the run-out group. He's got a chain. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> what was it, the history of Memphis wrestling? Or what? Yeah. I don't know if I know this record. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know the documentary. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, okay. So it was a companion piece to that. Okay, cool. Of actually, like, the the announcers at the wrestle. No, it's no, it's, it's music. Like Isn't music it some of the Jerry Lawler? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Barbarian stuff. There's all kinds of. Okay. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's a strange record, but mm-hmm. in strange in a cool, weird Memphis way. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know till Reese. Well, maybe Indie Memphis. Uh, when I saw the trailer for that doc, the history of Memphis wrestling. Oh, well, did you nice. see? Did you see? There's yeah. a history here that's very much tied to. Did you see the picture of? Uh, of uh, any other studio, I saw it. Yeah, the, um, the sketch or the. Yeah, the, you got to see this. The I'll fly through the air and shit in your hair. What I don't know if I did see that. <laughs> I, s- I was noticing that. I didn't know. I saw it from afar. Sputnik Monroe. Oh, what crazy! So, Sputnik is. This is an amazing piece of Memphis history. Yeah, he's so wrestling was huge here, especially Monday Night Wrestling, mm-hmm. and. Sputnik was back then in, in those days it was segregating mm-hmm. and so there was only a certain area where black people could sit and they called it the crow's nest up at the top and that's who Sputnik I guess was kind of a he was a bad guy or he played a bad guy mm-hmm. you know so that was those were that was his crowd he played to them those, you know they loved Sputnik Monroe mm-hmm. and he got big enough to where he finally said you know um, I'm not wrestling anymore unless you let the everybody have a chance to sit up close, so wow. he desegregated the Mid South Coliseum. What year would this be? I don't know. I should know that. Um, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. That's, but, that's amazing. But, uh, wow. He was a good friend of the Phillips family, and Jerry was uh, Jerry Lawler. Jerry Phillips. I'm sorry, Jerry Phillips. When he Excuse was me, 12 years old, Sputnik said, asked him, told him come over, and he was going to teach him how to wrestle. So Jerry Phillips became a professional wrestler at age 12, and he was billed as the world's most perfectly formed midget. And he was probably on early morning wrestling and stuff? Yeah, what? oh yeah. A, uh, what do you call himself? Delane, Delane Phillips, I think was his name. The world's most perfectly formed midget. And he was a bad guy, too, because he wasn't, you know... And, the crowd would get riled up like you're not a midget you know and, and uh he wrestled for like four years as a midget he, he wrestled you know that's amazing but, wow but he didn't have the features of yeah so uh that's some great memphis history. i guess you can say i don't know what's politically correct anymore midget little people i'm it, not sure i think they've managed to come up with a way to find a term for it that's more offensive than right. midget little people <laughs> sounds worse to me than <laughs> Anyway, that's quite a story. That's amazing. Um, this room's kind of full of junk right now, but the interesting thing is that... the Do you know what these are, these EMT plates? No. So these were the, the first reverbs that were ever made. So there's a thin steel plate suspended in there, and there's a damper, looks something like a big ceiling towel. And so by turning this one knob at the top, that's your decay time. You can go up to mm. five seconds, or it gets closer and it shortens your decay time. But they're they're beautiful sounding. There's mm. nothing, nothing sounds like these, and they all are tuned a little different. So they all have their own personalities. So the one in the back here is the original mm. Sam Phillips recording service, mm. and it just we, we use it on everything. Mm-hmm. It's you know. So between these plates and the chambers, the ambience that you can get out of this place is, this is priceless. Is, yeah. yeah, and you know we've had people that have come to record and and they've left. And they were hearing this as we were recording, but they didn't bother to print it onto the tape. And they get home and go, "What? Where? Where? Where did it go?" So you know, they sometimes they even you know come back and 
looking at the reverbs that we, hmm. that we had here. Wow. Another interesting thing about about here is that we kind of made a pact in the beginning out of respect to Sam. We don't have auto tune in the building. I respect that. So if you want it, your vocal tune, go back in the booth and sing it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or deal with or deal with the human imperfections that are what make music so amazing. what it is anyway. Yeah. So this is Matt's. Matt Rossman room. I don't know if that'll stay open But, uh, yeah, so, uh, this was, so my room was the control room of B. This was been the studio of Studio B. So Matt has, uh, fixed it all up and primarily uses it for mixing now. The project he's working on this week, he's mixing, I believe, 10 Elvis Presley concerts. Mm hmm so that's what he's in the middle of now. And it's really crazy when he sends Elvis's voice to the chamber and you hear Elvis coming down the hallway all day long like he's wow. trapped in that room back there <laughs> at the end of the hall. It's pretty crazy. Wow. How but long, uh, this, long, this how... is an old Spectrosonics board. Okay. Uh, this is exactly the kind of board that Stacks started on. And John Fry bought two of them. There are five of these this type made. Um, John Fry bought two of them, thinking if he, you know, if he had the same kind of console that Stax had, that maybe they would, uh, if they had overflow, they would start bringing Tarden. Mm. That's how Arden got, got it, got really got going. Mm. So Matt found this one. This is a guy in Canada that had this in a mobile truck all these years, and it's just stunningly beautiful. Just, just running the music through it, it just makes your eyes pop open. It's it's incredible. Mm. So we actually. When Matt's not using it for mixing, a lot of times we'll pop out some of these modules. We have a sidecar in Studio A that we actually use to record, use these to record through. So, um, yeah, we're kind of Spectrosonics crazy around here, which was Autotronic Spectrosonics was a Memphis company back in the day. So, incredible. How long has Matt been here? He was here before me, so. Three and a half years. Okay. I think he was here about six months before me. Or started doing stuff over here. Um, and there's an old eight-track, one-inch tape machine. So uh, he did the last Greyhounds record here. They did. They used that for, I think they made the record in three days. They booked three days, and they're like, yeah, man, we'll record everything on day one. Day two, we'll probably do a few overdubs and mix the record then. And I don't even know what we're going to do day three. <laughs> <laughs> Hang out? Yeah. And that's pretty much what they did, man. They knocked it out. It's, it was awesome. I keep thinking these are bathroom doors. <laughs> you know how the with the hand, with yeah. the silver on the side there. This nicest bathroom I've ever been to. <laughs> <laughs> Best sounding bathroom ever. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Okay, again, this is kind of full of stuff, but right now, but uh, this is the first Norman Lathe in Memphis. So all the early stack stuff was cut on this actual lay, the green crazy. onions, all that, Otis. Wow. That's crazy. And it's not working now, as you can see. It's got some pretty bad water damage. But You guys going to try to fix it? Or something I talked impossible? to Chris about it, you know, and I asked him what he thought it would take to get it going. He popped off, I think he said, you know, probably a cool hundred grand to get it going again. Mm -hmm. So for right now... Who would have cut those? Um... One of the cutters over here was Scotty Moore. Mm. After he left Elvis's band, there's pictures yeah. of Scotty sitting in here cutting vinyl records. So. I never knew he did that. Yeah, That's I didn't crazy. either until I saw him. Like, Is that Scotty? Wow. And Judd used to cut. Knox and Jerry used to cut. I think it's kind of everybody knew how mm. in some way or another to, you know, I think it was kind of a... And there were two... I think there were two lathes here at the time. What's the first record you cut in your career? And where? Let me think. I should know that. The first time I ever dropped the cutter head and played it back was um, my wife did a duet of Don't Let Me Down, the Beatles song with Lucinda Williams, and I cut that on to a record and played it back. and Cried? You're my knees went out from under me, man. <laughs> it, 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 it had me from what then. Year, what, what year that then? Oh, wait. Oh, wait, okay. So okay, I've okay. been doing it 10 years now. Yeah, yeah. And before that, though, you did loads of recording, engineering. And everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was mostly a producer, engineer, mixer guy, so... And I've been lucky to travel all over the, gotten to travel all over the world actually. 
but I would usually end up, you know, mixing almost everything I did, mm-hmm. Studio A at Arden. So, and I still did tons of recording over there. And you, what were some of the first things you recorded as an engineer? Um, the first record that I assisted on, my first real session that I did was the Vaughn Brothers with Nile Rogers producing. Mm. So Stevie and Jimmy, um, you know, and, and Stevie was in his in the helicopter crash two months after we were finished. Wow. So that record went multiple platinum. So the very first thing I ever worked on, I got... A, big platinum record i thought well that was pretty easy you know <laughs> that must be that must be what happens when you work at Arden. that's cool um but uh oh, you must have been pretty young i kind of started late in life i mean I, I moved to memphis when i was 26 okay okay you look younger so that, than you are then maybe so that i'm 55 now okay so, um had a good career and then you know you mentioned earlier all the Primal Scream Sessions and Afghan Wigs we're talking about. Yeah. There's a million other things. I was telling you how much um, it's not on tape. I'm going to tell you again. But the Afghan Wigs Gentleman for me was like a, a key record, especially over break. I, you know, had a bad breakup, you know. That's so the I, breakup, yeah. man. Yeah. It'll, yeah. it'll get Duly, you through that. Yeah, That's Duly, what he was going through. Duly uh, hit it on that one. Absolutely. But, uh, but, yeah, I've been fortunate to work on a lot of st- uh, you know a lot of great records. Um, I don't have any statues, but... I've worked on seven Grammy Award winning albums, you know. Um, the was, rules were different back then, so the engineer didn't get not assisted on some stuff that they got it too, but it's more life than uh, statues. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're nice, they're nice, but they're yeah, nice, yeah. but um but yeah, I, one of the big another big record I I worked on over there, I worked with Bob Dylan over there, so that was a big credit. Um What was the Dylan Arden record? He came over and it started to be he wanted to cut one song for a Jimmy Reed tribute record. And uh we did that and he liked it and then he had another tribute, a Doc Palmas tribute record. Uh we did we cut Boogie Woogie Country Girl. And we ended up uh, I could tell the whole story but it gets a little long, but basically he went to dinner, and I, I didn't. The manager had given me the speech about don't put him in the booth. He likes to sit in front of the drum kit, and so then the first song was pretty quiet, so we got away with it. The drum bleed, and then he's like, "My voice sounds far away," and I'm like, "Yeah, it's because the drum bleed, you know." And he goes, "What could we do?" And the manager had said, "He hates baffles. Don't even bring up putting him in the booth." He goes, "What could we do?" And I go. We could put a baffle up, so it had a window in it, so he could still see the drummer. So he said, "Let's try that." So we cut one like that, and he's like, "My voice still sounds far away. What else could we try?" I went, "Well, we could either put the drums in the booth, or we could put you in the booth." And he said, "How long would it take to put the drums in the booth?" I had three assistants working with me that day, so we we mm-hmm. could hop to it. I said, "Well, to tear them down, put them back up, and get sounds." Thirty minutes or so, and he said, "How long put me in the booth?" And I said, five minutes. And he just stood up, put his hands in his pockets, and walked out of the room. And these guys start coming in. We were cutting the tape. We had tape rolling all the time, so I was already had a stack of tapes this high. And they come in, they start taking the tapes out, leaving. I'm like, I blew it. Well, what else was I going to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the manager came in, and I said, are you guys leaving? He goes, no, he just said, uh, he's hungry. We're going to go get, take him back to the hotel and let him eat. Set him up in the booth. So Shit, wow. he came back and um, we cut Boogie Woogie Country Girl and he loved it. And we stayed up all night. I probably cut 10 songs. Three three things came out. The Blue Eyed Jane for the uh, Jimmy Rogers tribute, sorry. And uh, Boogie Woogie Country Girl for Doc Pomus. And there was another one I can't remember off the top of my head. But there's lots of outtakes that we did. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the night he asked if I would mix mix them for him the next day so Damn. he stayed another day and i mixed i mixed them for him and so that was a that was a thrill i bet yeah, yeah. god you worked on some incredible projects all pretty diverse yeah it's my resume yeah. my discography is pretty crazy i like it that way i never i was lucky i never really got pigeonholed it's far more interesting <laughs> here is the Secret weapon. We're approaching again, the, and this is the place. One of the yeah, places no photos. Photos. We're no approaching photos. the uh, a, what is that? A red door here, red pinkish door. Oh wow! So this is the echo chamber. Wow! Oh my gosh! 
Wow. So this is, you can hear, oh um, wow. you just run whatever through the speaker and mic it back up it's, and bring it up on the board however much you want. It's, it's really the most unbelievable echo I've ever heard. Wow. And you, we, can, we use it sometimes so subtly, just the tiniest bit of this where you don't even really hear the echo, but it just has this magic glue that just pulls things together. It really is unbelievable. Sam designed this. So he was quite an acoustician as well, you know. Yeah, it's pretty, this is something you just, yeah, yeah sketch total out. Genius. Total genius. So this one's the large one, and then the upstairs there's a medium sized one and a small one. So we have three different flavors of that too. What are these on the floor? Just... To suck up moisture. Because okay. there's nothing, there's no venting ventilation in here. So this was really moldy and it was full of junk and you know, TVs and pinball machines. And, all kinds of crazy stuff. So yeah, it was quite a job to get it all cleaned out and replastered and, and everything. But when we first got it all wired up and we ran something through the speaker and put it in here and we ran in here and we're like, don't touch anything. We're done experimenting. So we haven't really done a lot of experimenting. We just, it sounded so perfect. We just said, leave it where it is. And we'll do fun things like, you know, sometimes just leave the door open and and have a guitar amp in the hallway and it'll come all the way down yeah, the hall, yeah, bounce yeah. through there and sound like you yep. know, oh, that's okay. incredible. So the, the place was in pretty bad shape before you started really renovating it? Yes and, yes and no. I mean, or, or the main of, rooms that they were using were yeah. Really, yeah. There were a lot, there was, there was mainly water damage. There was some leaky, leaky roof that was the biggest issue to get and we'll go upstairs. I think Andrea Lyle or someone told us about the bar upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> crazy. The Johnny Cash cigarette burns in the countertop. Wow. <laughs> so we're heading up to the bar for those listening to the podcast. Wow. So this was the fountain. Uh, we got to get that happening again. They, they always talk about Sam loved frogs, so he would bring live frogs up here occasionally and let them hang out in the fountain. I don't know what became of them, or if yeah, they right. would escape eventually, or if they'd eat them, or what. Someone ate them. Behind that door is the other two echo chambers. Okay. But you got to kind of crawl around to get Holy one of them actually shit. bends around a corner like a horseshoe. This is killer. So this is, uh, they've probably done the most uh, redesigning up here. Uh, right now, they're, they, we've had a few events and parties and stuff like that here. But eventually, they're going to uh, take some of the stuff that was in the, the exhibit in the Country Music Hall of Fame and, you know, put some Sam memorabilia up on the wall and turn it more into a, a living room vibe with a great stereo system mm -hmm. and come listen to vinyl and can be more of a lounge for bands to hang out when they're recording. I love the red uh, shag carpet. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Out, take a nap, you know? I know. <laughs> and, and originally, this was just a long hallway, and this was all shotgun offices, so mm -hmm. a lot of the... This is an original piece of furniture in the office. Yeah, there. so that's, that's the Jack White couch. So okay. this was upstairs in front of Sam's office, and Jack was here. We did the, uh, Matt did the Margot Price record here, last Margot Price record here. So Jack was here, and he's a big Sam fan. And asked if he could take the couch and reupholster it for us. And that's the way it came back. I did not know that story. That's awesome. Because Jack was a, did, did upholstery before he kind of... Yeah, his first band was yeah. called The Upholsters, I think. Oh, so, um, oh like he, he himself did. upholstered it. Yeah. And he told us he hid something in it. So I think that was his trademark. He would always hide something and stuff that he <laughs> upholstered. That's amazing. Wow. Like that back there was the mail room back in the day. So they did everything out of here. Totally an independent company that... You know, all that's what boxes. Sam was yeah. all about. How many people were working here back in the day when it was? I don't know, fire? but there's a there's some crazy. I mean, some great photos. Judd is so such a knowledge knowledgeable source on that. But Judd is like, for instance, somebody said something about Leonard Skinner, and Judd comes out of his office and goes, "You know, Steve and Cassie Gaines used to work here." I went, "What?" And Judd gets back on his computer and he looks through his files and he goes, "Check it out, man. There's Steve and Cassie Gaines." Social security numbers. Weird, wow. But they did jingles and stuff here before he got Crazy. 
before he for Tanner well, Pepper or what? I don't know. Um, Wow. But he would be a Tanner Pepper, he would be a session guitar guy, and they would call him for. I don't think it was just jingles, but you know he would just do this and that before he joined Skinner. And of course, they both perished in the mm-hmm. plane crash. Mm-hmm. Wow! But stuff like that, you're like, oh yeah, he worked here. Really? <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> Incredible. It's just the like each of these rooms has its own distinct vibe. I know. We've recorded in all of them by now, you know. Where are all these on the wall? It looks like. So these are some of the songs from the publishing catalog. Oh, okay, you okay. I've heard of a couple of them. Just a few, Blue yeah. Slide shoes. Mystery Train. I Walk the Line Only. Jeez. <laughs> and Raunchy, that's the notes that's above the door outside. Uh, Oh, the that's, actual... That's the lick from Raunchy. And wow, that's neat. I was in... Uh, Susan and I were in Liverpool last year, and, um, you know, you hear every Beatles possible story that I thought I'd already heard, but one came up that when Paul brought George over to meet John, John, they played a little bit, and John was kind of like, mm-hmm, he's all right, I guess. But then George knew the lick from Raunchy, and that's when John went, he's in. That's all it Isn't took. That crazy, and that's the notes that are on the outside of this building. That's Damn, pretty wow. crazy tie-in. <laughs> Who made Raunchy a hit? Who is that? Not Bill Black. Um, can't bring it forward. I'll look it up. Wow. Bill Justice. Okay. Okay. Wow. So we can take photos of this still. Yeah. No. Okay. Jeez. This is the block. Damn, this is a lot bigger than they made it sound like. I mean, yeah. it's still small, yeah, but yeah. this is amazing. It's incredible. There's the cigarette burns. <laughs> but, you know, it's also funny to me that it's right across the hall from the accounting <laughs> office. You said, my you story. boys don't need to worry about the publishing. <laughs> See, I got that done. Have a drink. <laughs> you were saying the cigarette burns were, or, or were. Some say it's Johnny Cash, some are saying Charlie Rich, that I guess they had. Equal to hard times hitting an ashtray a lot of times. Wow. You know, that's, who knows? <laughs> but they didn't fix it. That's what I like about it. Right. You know, let's, let's clean great. those up. No, leave, leave them history. there. It's a little history. Do you guys drink in here a lot? Sometimes. Yeah. It's a nice place to come, you know, at the end of the day. You know, chill out for a while. But, uh, yeah, we, we try to use we try to use the entire facility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is really cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. The light fixture cool. is always amazing to me. It's, oh yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Crazy. But it's a it's a cool room to take pictures in because of all the mirrors and mm-hmm. stuff, you know. I love the wallpaper. Of course this is a pretty original wallpaper. Oh yeah. It yeah. Is. Love so here's where the couch, here's where the couch would go. Yep. Um, we got to take it apart to get it up. It won't make that turn around the stairs. So, <laughs> and there's another bathroom there, the makeup counter kind of thing. And then here's Sam's office. Yes, yeah, so yeah, no photos in here. Yeah, no. It's so okay to take a photo of the door. Yeah. Okay. Wow. This is uh, the shag carpet I liked in the previous room. This really takes yeah. it to a whole nother, whole nother place. Wow. So back in the day, this was all a deck, and they had a bandstand, tiki bar out there, and girls sunbathing outside of his office window. Wow. You know, he's got his personal jukebox over here, which is pretty wow. amazing. Oh, that's I always really call cool. it the 1960 iPod. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And the barometer behind the desk. I'm not like I love that clock, and it's actually a barometer. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> so where's the jukebox at? On the other side of the wall. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we have to get through plan on getting it going mm-hmm. again. Does anyone does anyone ever use this room anymore? It's just kind of um, not a lot. Well, do you know the band? You ever heard of the band Tora Tora? Yeah. 
Okay, so I just I was the assistant on their record 25 years ago, um, the Wild America record, and they're from Memphis, and we've remained remain dear friends all these years. Well, anyway, I just produced a record. They got a, a record deal from some English, uh, some European labels rather, and we had a scheduling conflict. So I asked Jerry, I was like, "If I promise not to make a habit out of it, can I record vocals up in Sam's office?" And <laughs> so I brought all my stuff and piled it up on the desk. Wow. And, Anthony did it all, all his lead vocal overdubs in here. And That's cool. It, it worked. It was Had awesome. Had ever recorded in here? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Gosh, the Probably tile. not with permission if they did. Yeah, yeah. The tiles behind the desk are really incredible, too. Yeah. And then also. Every little piece of it. Incredible. And back down that hallway, there's just another couple of. Couple of offices right mm-hmm. there. And that's pretty much the uh, nickel tour, man. This is like, I, I feel like I owe you about, uh, I guess I need about 10,000 records or something. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a thank you. It's incredible. Well, good. I'm glad you like it. And you can probably tell I, I love showing showing it to people, especially who appreciate it, you know? It's, it's, it's beautiful. And I do feel lucky that I get to come in here every day and work. So. It's nice. You can sit behind a lathe. I know. Yeah. No, I mean, and listen to records. All yeah, day, it's right? a real bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna turn this off. So thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Any last words? Um, I hope I don't have any last words. <laughs> I'm gonna lay here, gonna sit here writing a song. Every time one comes along, I'm alright. Gotta be alright